There was always this belief that even if you weren't physically present with your, your master, that there was a form of communication that continued between one another. Hello, everyone. It's episode 94 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sifu Gary Cecil. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, I'm very proud to say, makes the world's best sparring gear and some awesome apparel, all for those of you involved in the traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. If you're new to the show or you're just not familiar with what we make, check out our sparring gloves. They're more comfortable, more durable. Basically, we took a standard design and found all the ways we could improve on it. If you're used to the normal foam sparring gear that falls apart, imagine those gloves, but better in absolutely every way. You can learn more about our gear and the rest of our products at whistlekick.com. If all you want is gear, we're selling a lot of sparring gear on Amazon. Seems everyone likes the convenience of having us there, and we're happy to oblige. If you're looking for show notes, those are on a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, get in on that newsletter action. We offer special content to subscribers. It's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email you a few times a month, never spam, never sell your info. And sometimes we send out a pretty generous coupon, so nothing to lose there. On episode 94, we get to talk with Sifu Gary Cecil a Kung Fu instructor who was suggested as a guest by one of his students. We had a great conversation, and I found myself really interested in some of the things that Sifu Gary had to say. You might think that here we are close to 100 episodes in, we've heard everything, every background someone comes from in every way that you can view the martial arts. But that's clearly not the case, as Sifu Gary gave me plenty to think about during and after our chat. So enjoy. Sifu Gary, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, we were just chatting a little bit, and, and um, of course, I appreciate your flexibility. I can let the listeners know that we, we've got some time zones between us, and as time zones are, are wont to do, as anyone has ever sold across timelines <laughs> knows, sometimes we, we get that math wrong, and, and I appreciate your flexibility uh, with with working with me and not being offended that I call you called you too early the first time. No, and that was fine. <laughs> so, of course, you're not on the show to talk about calendars and, and time zones. You're here to talk about martial arts. So let's get started. How did you get started in the martial arts? I started as a young person. Uh, I was very fortunate. I was one of those young people that, of course, watched some of the earliest shows of martial arts that came out of the 60s. And, you know, I remember Bruce Lee and his dynamic uh, demonstrations of skills in the Green Hornet way back when, uh, and how inspiring Bruce Lee was to martial artists, but had no uh, opportunity for any real formal training much because I was a rural kid. You know, Growing up in rural West Virginia, not much access to a whole lot of uh, more sophisticated martial arts schools, but I read the magazines and had an interest, and then I was fortunate enough to discover that there was a master who had come into town, uh, had just gotten in from Okinawa and wanted to start a school, and some of my friends were going to sign up from school, and I jumped in with it and uh, was off and on as I could with, with him and, and actually ended up some of his students and to be more, more my primary instructors for a while uh, in, in, a, the, um, in an art that was a blend between the Chinese Kung Fu of southern China uh, as it moved into Okinawa. Some would call it Chinese Goju or Gangru, uh, which is the the same philosophy that Miyagi brought into Okinawa and down to Japan eventually. Um, the idea of the hard and soft um, concepts in martial arts. So my first exposure was really to more Okinawa Te, you know, hand fighting uh, with the Southern Shaolin influences on that, plus how it, it had been adapted through, through Miyagi Sensei. Um, so that's how I got started in it and spent some years just working with that stuff uh, until I went to college and discovered that there was a Shaolin master I had access to. Uh, 
actually he kind of found me because I was teaching a martial arts class for the physical education department at my college. They had given me that opportunity for credit, so I was helping out and doing that for students, having a good time. One of this Shaolin master students came and visited my class one day, and the next thing you know, I've, I've been I've been told or given an invitation to come visit. So it happens in his school, it's word of mouth. He didn't didn't advertise. It wasn't uh, uh, something that he was out trying to recruit, but you got invited if someone thought you might fit in. So that's how I got into the Shaolin side of it. And my teacher back in West Virginia had actually encouraged that in me. He had worked with some of the Shaolin Kung Fu side of it uh, in his experience, and we actually experimented with that a lot in our classes. So I was ready for it, and we took it from there. That's cool. So when you received that invitation, did you have any um, – was there was there any fear you were going to be challenged? Oh, yeah. Almost, <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I, I was leading – we were doing our own sparring, and uh, people may know Goju uh, is where – sparring kind of originated the way that most people understand it now. Uh, it was an effort to try to practice without causing real harm. And uh, so those early on, those, those artists had tried to devise ways. And I believe Goju was one of those keenly involved in creating the, the sparring system. Now, Shaolin sparring was a little different. They sparred, too, for hundreds of years. But theirs was heavy contact, and it was rough. Ours was rough, too, quite frankly. It, it was bare knuckle. And you really had to stress control. So control was a key part of that training, which I still appreciate, by the way, a lot. Uh, especially, you know, we don't have gloves on. you got to be careful. But it also you know, let us use our hands in different ways. And, and uh, so uh, now I don't want to get off track there, but uh, so let's continue. Okay, sure. And feel free to go off track. You know, we're all about <laughs> tangents here. And, and oftentimes that's where the, the best stuff comes out is the things that we weren't planning to talk about or even the things that guests have come on and forgotten about. We've had people that have, have said even on the air, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't thought about this in 20 years kind of thing. So please feel free to let it wander if that's where you want to take it. Yeah. But, but yeah, so anyway, I guess my point was we're doing it. We're doing sparring, but uh, I thought my sparring was pretty good. I was at that time a second degree black belt teaching at the college. Uh, I had a rude awakening. Uh, and when I went down there and watched these guys doing Shaolin fighting, I, uh, the, the, the master walks over and asks me if I want to fight. And I look at him and say, no, I don't think I'm ready for this yet. And that may have been actually what accepted me into the school because I, it was humility he was looking for. He'd had a lot of black belts walk in and, with chips on their shoulders and challenging and thinking they're hot stuff. And I was the first one to actually come in and say, I think I need to learn from you. And he accepted me. To borrow probably the most used martial arts cliche, empty your cup, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah, you were there to it. learn. And, that was it. Yeah. And I, was, I think I was the only one at that, during that period of time he ever did that for, quite frankly. Most of the other black belts were, didn't stay. Well, uh, they were either beat up so bad, they left or they were carried out. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not nice. If you came in with an attitude, you got humbled real fast. But I realized I was in over my head. And I did get to spar, but I sparred one of his middle rank guys who humiliated me, quite frankly. Really? Oh, it was it was one of the most humiliating but most enthralling things I've ever experienced. I, I'd never had a guy disappear on me before. And this was a green belt in, in the Shaolin school, and he puts me in there with him, and we're going bare knuckle. Though he liked to use the gloves, which to me was like, gloves? Wow, I've never used gloves. Um, but we got together, and this guy just disappeared right in front of me. I mean, I'm standing there looking around, where'd he go? It was one of the best things I've ever seen. Uh, and when he tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned around and he smiled at me, I looked at the teacher and says, I'm in this class if you'll have me. Teach me that technique. <laughs> 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 oh, that was just fabulous. Uh, I was I was embarrassed, but just thrilled at the same time. If, if that makes sense, it's a pretty incredible experience to to go to another school and realize how much more there is that you can learn. Mm -hmm. And I think the the more you have learned it at one school or another school, the more overwhelming 
that feeling can be. I've experienced it a few times, and it's terrifying, but so exciting. Exactly. So I was so glad to be there, and and I was so glad to be allowed to to participate with the higher ranks of his school because that was only a privilege granted by the by the Sifu and uh, on my part. It was it was a gift. I I hadn't been there as long as the others. I didn't necessarily earn it the way they did, and I realized that. So I was always trying to be. Uh, open and respectful because some of them had paid their dues in much better ways than I had. Uh, but he had said that he felt I'd paid my dues in my other training and I'd trained hard and he respected that. But that was his decision, his call, and I was very flattered and honored that he accepted me in his high ranks. So basically the closed door school is what we're talking about. Okay. So Interesting. So did you learn how to disappear? Uh, yeah. <laughs> how, how long did that how long did that take you to learn? Well, I don't know or if how I long ever, did that take? I don't know if I ever did it as well as that Greenbelt did, but he was just <laughs> exceptional. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, yeah, I, I, we we teach that technique in all of our schools now. Yeah, I teach it. Oh, cool. So of course, that's a great story, and you know we didn't even go into it. Looking, looking for a story like that, but there's bunches of them. So let's keep going. Right, <laughs> tangents, tangents. We're all about tangents. Yeah. Do you have another one? If somebody, you know, were to put you on the spot and say, "What's your best martial arts story?" What would you tell them? Oh, there's, there's many, many. Uh, there's so many. Um, I, I don't know e- either. Uh, I think one of the things that comes to mind, though, is uh, in, in uh, about the potential stories itself is. I was inducted in the, in the U.S. Martial Arts Hall of Fame in 2009, and I came in uh, that year. We were in Nashville, Tennessee, and it was largely attended by the Black Dragon Society. And I guess they had some stuff going on that I wasn't aware of, or some apologies being made back and forth between various people and whatever it was. The uh, I was very much aware of the history of the Black Dragon Society, and as were my some of my my students who were there with me. And I'm not going to get into any of that because that's their business. But uh, the, uh, the the opening ceremonies had a story. And stories can be good stories or they can be distracting stories. And I, I listened to this story being told at that event. You know, we're black tie, all these famous martial artists in the room. Um, I mean, I was inducted with... Uh, with Dukes, you know, the guy that the movie was made about, uh, with by Von Dom, Frank Dukes, mm. yep. and uh, he was there with me and and uh, some others to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. And uh, I guess it had some history with these folks. But the the story that started the whole thing off has left us puzzled ever since. I mean, my my students left there going, "What was that?" It made no sense to us at all. It just encountered anything we we did or or knew. And I don't want to be disparaging because I'm not naming names, but sometimes a story is not every story should be told. I guess is what I'm saying. So right. stories themselves have have power and they can instruct us, but sometimes they can also leave us shaking our heads. And I hope I don't do that in this interview at all. But that's one experience about storytelling that I found is a caution. I love the stories, but we need to think them through a little bit, make sure we know why we're telling it and what we're trying to say. Uh, I agree. So that's a story about stories. Okay. <laughs> you took it in a very different angle than anyone else has. I, I like that. <laughs> well, and unfortunately for the, per- for that, for the person that told it, and he might not have realized that we took it that way, but my school has, that have used, has used that story as a joke now for years. Uh, but meaning no, no disrespect, because I think the intention of the story was different than the way we took it. Uh, and and so I don't think it was ever intended to be used the way we used it, and I'll admit that, but it was rather humorous, too. We just found it amusing. So uh, yeah. at the same time, anyway, that's just one aside, but it, it just is a caution about when I do tell these stories, I'm trying to accomplish something with my, my students, and, and that is to encourage them, to fascinate them with the art, to uh, make them hungry for experiences in the art that will feed them and, and build them up. And that's what I'm after. 
and that's all any of us should really want. I mean, that, that's the that's the goal, or at least one of them, one of the major goals, of course. In other words, it's not about me or just how wonderful I am, right? Uh, right. Or how wonderful some of my teachers have been, but does the story really talk to us all? And, right. and I say that because I am, in essence, a warrior priest. I, I'm actually an ordained minister who also is a at the highest level of of my particular art and. Uh, in the, the truest of the Shaolin traditions, that was the way it's been. Uh, and uh, so I'm a storyteller by profession on both sides, as a martial artist and as uh, a minister. Uh, and so I found the power of stories to be quite amazing at times. Oh, cool. So let's go back. Let's pretend that you know you're you're in school back in in West Virginia mm-hmm. and. That gentleman doesn't come back from Okinawa, doesn't open a school, and you don't find martial arts. Where do you think you'd be in your life now? <laughs> well, I would have found martial arts. Or martial arts would have found me. I, I uh, For some reason, I'm convinced that the art was going to find me if I didn't find it. And I don't, it's hard to explain. Uh, some might call it predestination, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I just, I, I, there's no way I could avoid it. I, it was going to find me. Um, even before this teacher came from Okinawa, I was already interested enough that I was beginning to seek out the information. I would have, been, uh, have eventually found a class. I would have found my way somewhere else. My bet would have been the first thing I would have ended up doing is, was Aikido. Um, still one of my favorite arts. And I would have found an Aikido class somewhere. I'm convinced of that. Why do you think you would have sought out Aikido versus something else? Because of Aikido's philosophy. Okay. The um, the gentle art in, in its own respect. Uh, it's it's an art, uh, and you've probably had Aikido people on your on before. Mm-hmm. It's an elegant, gentle art that can be very violent. Don't tell me wrong. It can be very painful. But its approach is was more one more of of uh, truly defensive and uh, cultivating the spirit in a way that we're not trying just to be uh, harmful to someone, but simply not wishing their energy to cause destruction any further than it needs to, and re- redirecting that energy. Um, I just liked the whole philosophy of the uh, uh, Aikyo Kami and some other phrases that one might pull into that, and it influenced me a lot early on. Cool. And and being a minister, you can see where that would appeal to me too. Mm, uh, absolutely. That in a sense, you learn to turn the other cheek. But when I turn that cheek, uh, if the guy falls down, uh, I'm sorry. I just turned my cheek. Uh, his force worked against him. <laughs> where did your ministry come into play chronologically? Was this after college or something you you started in college? Uh, sort of simultaneously. Uh, okay. In college, the about the time I was introduced to the Shaolin School, uh, which doesn't call itself that up front. It's the American School, but it, it teaches Shaolin arts. Um, I was already uh, committing myself to uh, a Bible religion major in college, and went on the seminary from there. And that's one reason why I couldn't stay for more years and more time involved at the school where I was going was because I you know I needed to move on and finish my education and so forth. So I knew the time was coming. I needed to just move on and and uh, do what I could to enjoy the art and grow in the art without the benefit of being in the class any longer. Uh, and I made it a point to do just that and to share the wealth as I knew it and teach what I knew but also to continue growing as best I could. So I was always seeking out more opportunities to learn something along the way, too. So, um, But it became, martial arts became a, a hobby for me in, re- in regard to ministry, uh, but also a tool. Uh, the struggle that some people have there is it's a real keen struggle between a violent art and a religion that teaches uh love your enemy, and turn the other cheek. And how do those two things work together? 
I had to resolve that conflict in myself somewhere along the way, and I, I did. It, I'm very much at peace with it all. Uh, part of the art being, for me, just a, a means of self-development and personal improvement and personal discipline and challenge that I could apply in some constructive ways in my life. Uh, I, when I started a class at the University of North Dakota, it was through the church as an outreach into the university, but not so much just to do evangelism, but just to get some kids together who had nothing better to do, who might be interested in the art, and build some relationships and see where they would go from there. Um, so I didn't preach at them, but I did offer the stories and the moral lessons and begin to at least uh, express where I think faith is key in understanding the arts. Uh, my teacher was a Christian, by the way, my Shelling teacher. And that worked against him back in the early 70s. Um, working with the Buddhists, there came a point in his ranking um, as a high disciple when his faith became an issue and they did not want to promote him because he was Christian and they were Buddhist. And there was a prejudice. Bruce Lee uh, also was fighting the same fight uh, as to his having the right to teach Occidentals. Uh, beyond a certain level. Uh, my teacher was going through the same fight where his teacher went to bat and said he might be white and he might be Christian, but he should be here. And there was a big ensuing disagreement in the in the Shaolin circles about that whole thing that paralleled what Bruce Lee was fighting for uh, and around the same time period, I guess, um, that was fascinating in itself. I'm not going to get into the whole story, but in essence, my teacher, uh, with his master and another person, voluntarily withdrew from that group of, of Shaolin priests and continued training on their own to finish it out. Uh, literally left the temple to finish the training because of prejudice and religious discrimination. So we've come a long way, and those, those pioneers fought the fight for us, like my teacher, like Bruce Lee, and some other masters willing to step up and say, I don't accept that. We need to move forward. Uh, I feel privileged to have known someone that was part of that fight and have, have been taught by someone who understood the price paid to bring us martial arts as we know it today, freely given to to us regardless of race or uh, background. So uh, when I when I started teaching, I, I had the same openness. I wasn't going to discriminate with students. They didn't have to be Christian to study with me. Uh, we were just going to get together and build relationships and have a great time together and discipline ourselves and see where it led. And that, that's what happened. And I think that the best schools are founded with that for at least one of the ideals. And certainly that's an interesting glimpse into a time period that I don't think a lot of us think about when we think about the martial arts and, and the difficult early times. We think about the challenges being around availability of instruction and, and sharing knowledge and um, you know, things being a little bit more brutal in the in the instruction style. But I don't know that I've ever heard anyone talk about being discriminated against for their faith in this country in the context of martial arts training. But of course, people aren't always doing the right, or people are fallible, I guess is a better way to put it. And there's a great example of it. Yeah, and again, that was that's old history now. Uh, the Shaolin folks, as I understand it, and, and my, my teacher actually shared this with him at some point. You know, they broke off and and continued training and did their own thing. And he opened his own school and and admittedly said, you know, I've you know what you're doing here is is you know I broke away from the from the Shaolin temple. Uh, they they reapproached him years ago. Actually, I guess with an apology. So I mean, we've come a long way. I don't want to leave it wow. with this discrimination and so forth as the final word. It was by no means the final word. We moved well past that. And uh, now he chose not to reaffiliate with them, even though they invited him to, but because he was happy and and doing what he wanted to do. But they did come back later on and, and basically acknowledge that that his school was superior and that they respected what he was doing and wanted him in the fold. And 
uh, tried to make make it up to him. So uh, I thought that was just a good sign in itself of how far we've come. We don't even, and you're right, we don't talk about these things anymore. That's, a, that's what, 30, 40, you know, a yeah. long time ago that these battles were fought. But our ancestors in the faith, or our forefathers, had to endure some of that, and I don't forget it. So I, I uh, brought some of that spirit into my schools, too. Just glad to have these students. Anybody who was getting bored at school and <laughs> wants something constructive to do, come along and check us out. And we, we just had a great time together. And the organization that I'm now in charge of began, uh, technically began there and has grown ever since. Uh, so the some of the great lessons I learned from my teachers that I've passed on to, to how we organize now and how we conduct ourselves now, uh, those have paid off and have worked, and we have very dedicated students. Oh, that's great. So, you know, life isn't always roses, right? I mean, we all go through some challenges, through struggles. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that you've probably got a story somewhere in there about one of your struggles and how your martial arts experience helped you through it. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if I have a great story about that directly. Uh, my struggle was that internal one between the reconciling what can be a violent art with a gentle faith, uh, which has been, was an ongoing dialogue within myself a lot for some years, and, and accepting criticism. I, I remember teaching at a YMCA in North Carolina, I was teaching, I agreed to teach a Tai Chi class for the community. Um, I don't charge, by the way, when I teach those classes. I do, I consider community service, so I'm not trying to uh, do it in a spirit other than simply I enjoy the art, love to share it, and want everybody healthy. So, right. I'm, I'm a local pastor, I'm at the Y, I'm teaching this class, and to have some Christians come in and begin to criticize what I'm doing, saying that it's heathenistic and pagan, and I'm teaching false doctrine and misleading people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those moments hurt. You know, it hurts when people don't understand what you're trying to do and want to label you that you're some sort of demon because you are using an Eastern concept, uh, some exercises that are Eastern to to work with some people for their health. Um, I knew where I stood on this. I know, knew what I was trying to accomplish, and it was not in conflict with, with faith. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are some people that just don't understand the art very well or have these, they impose their own conceptions on it or they impose their own prejudices again. And I had to face some of that, that somehow or another in more conservative circles like the conservative South, <laughs> uh, there's that risk that when you do martial arts, you're, somehow or another operating in a different arena than the faith these people understand. So I've always had to deal with that. Um, but it's not that it's been one in particular story other than I can think of the YMCA one, for instance, and just hearing that criticism there uh, where these folks would walk in and just start saying things. You know, coming how, in and, how did you respond? Uh, at first, you just keep teaching your class, ignore them, and, and at mm. another point, because basically, I said, you know what? You shall know them by their fruits, folks. Uh, we're doing something good here, and these people are feeling healthier. I think God is into health. God wants us to, to be our well-being is important to God. Just check out, uh, and I could give them a Bible lesson on that. But so if you don't, if you don't believe that God's interested in our health and well-being, then I don't think we're talking about the same religion here. That's about what I, what I said. Sure. So. And I, of course, I could give give you a long theological explanation of that, but I'm not going to do that on, on this show. <laughs> we'll stay we'll stay on the martial arts side of it. But sure, but the, sure. But but the religious you know, part th- of it. I mean, you know, the, the Shaolin were were religious people operating doing their art. You know, so right, right. And we've we've kind of dabbled in this subject a little bit on the show. The idea that there is a, if not a bind between martial arts and faith. They're at least complementary. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, when we take a step back, and one of the things that has come up on the show is that 
most of our guests, and, and I'm going to speculate a good portion of our listeners at least, view martial arts, traditional martial arts, as a tool for personal development. Exactly. And when we look at it in that way, the comparisons between martial arts and faith really aren't that different. No. And I know no. for me personally, and, and um, the two absolutely uh, are, are not just complementary, but do have overlap. You know, and, and I think you've got it. Uh, I have taken some of the principles uh, from martial arts at times and applied them to the faith arena that I, in which I, I serve. And at the same time, in the faith arena, it helps inform the martial arts circle. So there, there's a constant dialogue back and forth, informing one another about where one lives, where one stands. When do you take a stand? For what do you stand? And what is important? Uh, and when, you know, how should you respond to violence? We're in a time now, and I'm talking to my instructors now, about the importance of really getting uh, reality specific about where we are and what we're teaching our students. A lot of what we do is we have fun. In my, my classes are, are fun. We work hard, but there has to be a sense of personal grat gratification and reward in that. We like to laugh. We'd like to tell the stories on each other, uh, you know, a lot of humor, lightheartedness in the midst of serious training, and and that's part of what makes it successful. But at the same time, you're learning serious techniques that can really defend yourself in a dire situation. And I just think we're living in a time now that we're uh, even on higher alert. Uh, I don't know how to say this, but I just simply sent a note out. You can see what's been happening with threats of terrorism that are getting closer and closer to home. I've got schools yeah. in Minneapolis and there's a huge Somali population up there. Uh, and I'm not disparaging the pot Somalis at all, but within that group of people, there have been a few that have been caught and captured trying to be supporters of ISIS. And, uh, that's close to home with my schools. They're, they're in the midst of that, uh, situation where you have a lot of folks brought in as refugees and you don't, you know, most of them are just there to work hard and, and try to make a living and take care of the families. But th it remains a question mark uh, that within that culture somewhere, there may be a few individuals that could be a problem. And um, I'd say I'm not trying to cast any aspersions or, you know, on, on other yeah. people, but we all need to be alert in what we're doing in our classrooms. Make sure you're talking about what happens if you're in the theater and somebody comes in the back of the theater and opens fire. You know, look at the new scenarios we're dealing with. What happens if you go to a dance and someone comes in and tries to you know, reap havoc? We are in serious times now, and I just want my schools to stay alert and make sure the training is updated to these possible scenarios. So we're actually working with this stuff now. What would you do? Call in law enforcement. Find out what's legal, what one can morally and ethically do. Uh, these are big questions for us today. Right, right. And, you know, it's interesting because it wasn't that long ago that the experience someone took away from a traditional martial arts school was enough to keep them safe, first and foremost, because it gave them the confidence that other people tended to, to on a, a deeper level, recognize and, and not mess with you, right? You know, if somebody's confident, they're, they are rarely a target. Right, I agree. And so I think that that is where the benefit to traditional martial arts training has been for the most part. But we are now in, at a t point in time, as you've said, where there are other threats that aren't going to evaluate that confidence. That it's it's I don't want to say it's irrelevant, but in those scenarios it is. And the 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 important thing is uh, too. I agree with everything you've said there in the analysis, but and that's been my experience. But the important thing too is in an, in, a, in a stress situation, it's interesting. Someone can step up and take leadership, while others do nothing. You know, fear will freeze people, or they'll simply follow, but they're not. But you need that someone who either has been trained or confident enough that simply says, here's what we're going to do. And then you know, 
People will follow someone like that. I want my, my students to the type that if something bad happens, they need to know how to act and not freeze. You know, you need to do something. So I'm just hoping they're prepared to, to you know, they're getting their minds prepared to be the, the people who act on the behalf of others, to save lives, to do the right thing uh, without, without hesitation. So if we can build individuals like that who are going to be leaders in their community and do the right thing to save lives, I'm, I'm a very happy instructor. Mm. And I think most instructors would agree mm. yeah. with you. I think mo- most would, would likely have the same yardstick to measure by. Now, other than, say, your, your first instructor in West Virginia and your original Sifu as you were going to school, if we were to take those two out, who would you say has been the most influential person in your martial arts upbringing? <laughs> oh, goodness. In my upbringing, I like when an answer starts with a laugh. Uh, I mean, in my upbringing, you talk about early on then? At, at any point. Someone, if we, if we look at the whole of your martial arts career. Mm-hmm. Who's contributed the most to it for you? Other than with you. those two primary folks. Yeah. Yeah, and we take those two out just because we usually get some fun answers, some unexpected answers coming in. Yeah, and this is not just looking at someone at the distance or someone you admire, or is it looking at hands-on? Or does it However you want to define it. Well, because I, admittedly, I, I first of all, I'll do a two-part answer. I was right there when we got into this whole thing with you know, Bruce Lee's first appearance on TV. Uh, I, I joined with thousands, I'm sure, who were just fascinated by what Bruce Lee brought to the screen. So he, he was one of my first exposures to really get interested in something like that. And I'll just give him credit. Um, you know, the early show Kung Fu, even though David Carradine was no real martial artist, but uh, looked good. And that was supposed to be Bruce Lee's role. But again, there's that prejudice because he was actually right. Chinese. I think that worked against him. Uh, I don't know if you knew that background, but there's something in that as well with that role. But, uh, yeah, we did a whole episode talking about the history of Bruce Lee. And, and personally, I put in quite a few hours of research so, pulling in a lot of those things. And yeah, it's it's quite clear that that role was written for him. Mm-hmm. And then some higher ups at at the production house. At, I think. So from I, I from who, a distance, I I have great admiration for the earliest pioneers bringing it to America. Uh, they influenced me to get to get to open my eyes and say, "Wow, I now want to do something." Uh, on a personal level, though, actually, it was it was the classmate of mine in school uh, who got me started in in that first class, uh, who just stayed beside me through high school uh, training with me and uh, he's not doing the martial arts anymore but but Michael was a was my one of my best friends and Michael Clary and when you know he continued to train with me and encourage me along the way that uh, kept me into it and kept me going and to the point that I was when I went off to college I was able to continue it there at the college and which left the doors open for further development so uh, it's not the not someone out there that you would really uh, you know I can't give you some great story of some bigger than life person that walked into my life it's just the ordinary martial artist who loved what he's doing and uh, other than my my main characters uh, you know, Michael had a great influence on me uh, with my life hands on as as my best friend and. And then just watching at the distance, Bruce Lee getting this whole thing started. I enjoyed the other guys that came along. Seagal was fun to watch. You know, that's Hollywood, and it really did promote an interest in the arts. Uh, but you know, for me, I'm old enough that I I appreciated it early on, so it got me started. Yeah. Do you remember your first Bruce Lee movie? We're testing a theory. I'm curious. My first Bruce Lee movie. Which one was it? Um, I think the first movie I saw, other than the TV shows, right? Sure. Or, or, or let, let me break it out. The first time you saw him, I guess. I think it was the Green Keep Hornet. Okay. And the episode that I remember to this day, and it was unscripted, by the way, was when they told him to to go into this room 
and do something, and he goes in and he jumps way up in the air and kicks the light out, which was about seven or eight feet up, which was not in the script. And that's when everybody, the people behind the camera, were going, "Holy cow! What did we just see him do?" <laughs> you know, it just, and that was they left it in because it was an amazing scene where he walks his room, jumps up, and does a kick, kicks the <laughs> light bulb out, and I'm going, "Wow!" <laughs> so yeah, I, that's my first recollection of Bruce Lee. It, it seems that, especially for Bruce Lee, people have very vivid memories of the first time that they saw him, mm-hmm. be it the first movie they saw, the first TV show, and whatever it was still holds a very high place for them. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know about you and whether or not you still watch or would watch The Green Hornet, but we've had plenty of people on the show who saw one of his movies, you know. Um, and when we ask them how they got started, it's quite often, I saw this Bruce Lee movie. And when we get to the part, what's your favorite martial arts movie? It is still that movie. I mean, that happens very often on this show. I bet you get a lot of Enter the Dragon, don't you? Yeah, Enter the Dragon is definitely the most popular Mm -hmm. answer for him. I mean, that, that was the movie that pretty much launched martial arts in the 70s in america sure did now i i enjoyed i think my first movie was the big boss known as fists of fury yeah and you know still fun uh but to this day it's comical too though i mean that's the thing that we started learning is these movies had a little bit of a comic edge to them and you know when when he he kicks a guy through the wall and there's this perfectly symmetrical human shape Right. The wall. <laughs> <laughs> Drywall doesn't break that way. That's right. That was one of my favorites. I just started laughing. See, look at that. <laughs> so anyway, I remember that too. It was one of my first memories for the movie was that. So yeah, uh, it's hard to get around what he did for us in this country by bringing it to America um, yeah. and exposing us to it. Yeah. Have you participated in competition at all? Most of my competitions would have been in-house, The uh, and that was by design. Uh, none of our schools trained for competitions. The The problem we had with, uh, with that is, uh, and we tested this theory out, by the way. Uh, in, the, in the Shaolin School, they fight really hard, and you get disqualified real fast in those days uh, because of con- over-excessive contact or whatever. And we also realized it wasn't safe for other people. Uh, you know, when you train in an environment, you get used to that intensity, then you learn how to defend yourself. If you go up against a more classically trained Korean artist or something who would, might be very confident, competent, uh, but play by a certain set of rules and you know the way they do things. Uh, it, it, I'm not saying it was unfair, but in a way it would be because you know contact was not as intense in some of those schools. Uh, just like the way I began with learning to pull your punches, you know, open hand sure. fighting, you, you didn't make contact, uh, in certain ways because it was forbidden. And those guys, when they got on those big six sound gloves, they were just going at it like crazy. And it was really more like what people might be more accustomed to today, uh, with kickboxing. Uh, but early, early on low ranks trained like that. And these guys just got started hitting so hard that we, competitions didn't uh, meet their needs, nor w- would we have been welcomed in some of those competitions. Uh, I, uh, I I have one. Uh, I trained a, a student early on, who in, and we entered him into a national competition, and he won it. So nationally, we're one for one. Uh, <laughs> those are good numbers. Those are our numbers. We've had other competitions where I've trained a I've trained a student or two from other schools, and they've always either won or ranked real high up there with something. We ha- we have a form we teach that wins everywhere it goes, and in regional competitions or and national. So um, we have very good success rate when we do something competitively. I personally didn't do the national scene. I w- just had no desire, but we did throw a few of our people in there one or two times to see how we did, and we did fine. Um, you know, it's funny, you, you don't train for it. You walk in, you walk out champion. It's kind of a strange feeling sometimes, but, 
we had a good time with it. And but we don't train that way, and we bless we wish them well. And then, and those who enjoy it as a competitive sport, we appreciate them and appreciate what they do. Uh, just not being not, not our tech. It's not our preference or direction we take sure. our schools. Sure. Now, if you could train with someone that you haven't yet, and we'll even open up to people that have passed on, who would you want to train with? Hmm. That's a good question. Because I think I trained with the best. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Uh, uh, my teacher was, was may have been one of the best in the world, uh, though he's not well known, but he said that his master told him in the shallow circles he was one of the top six in the world. So wow. uh, I was glad to train with him. I, st- I still would not change that at all. I'd train with him. But if I had a, a second person to train with, um, you know, I, I don't think I would train with Bruce Lee. I think, I don't know, I don't think I could deal with him. But Because uh, <laughs> he was also, it was, you know, Bruce Lee was Bruce Lee. Uh, right. I, and I did train with a student that my teacher said was probably as good as Bruce Lee, and he was a little too intense for me. So I would stay away from Bruce Lee. I, I think I would have enjoyed uh, Chuck Norris and probably could have uh, – but uh, I would have enjoyed Chuck Norris. I would have enjoyed Bonsu Han, Hapkido, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, I think he was, was a really neat guy. Uh, Ed Parker. Would have been fun to train with as well in Kempo. So there's a lot of good ones out there. But if I could, if I had my number one choice, I would have loved to have been a student, I think, other than with my, my master. Uh, Miyagi Sensei. Yeah. Miyagi, a, a goju. I think he'd have been fascinating to work with. I think anytime you talk about someone that originated a style, I think the ability to train with them, not for, for me, not so much for the, the physical instruction, but for the mental concepts. Why did they choose these movements, these forms, this set of martial arts stuff to become their curriculum? Exactly. To kind of get into their head. And I've been, that's what the research I've been doing for years for uh, the benefit of my school has been that direction. I've continued to go back and look at some of those old uh, Miyagi uh, direction he was taking with some some of the forms and why he chose those moves, uh, the influence that Southern Shaolin had on him when he studied in Southern China, yeah, uh, and breaking them down and and continuing to learn from them. We don't teach those forms per se, but I, I find that some of the movements that were part of the White Crane system or the dragon system that, that made it down to Fujian area, Fuxiao, those southern style uh, martial arts uh, from the Shaolin and the five ancestors um, that have influenced us a lot. Uh, you see, the, you see the connections. I mean, there's movements that moves that influence a lot of stuff, and it's been really fun to make the connections between what became known later as karate, which used to be the China hand, uh, and, and its roots in, in those uh, southern China mm. arts. Uh, so I've spent a good bit of time research on that. Interesting. Yeah, we just did, um, did an episode. In addition to the interview episodes, we have uh, episodes that come out on Thursdays on topics. And that's, you know, we profiled Bruce Lee for one of them and uh, did another on, um, for anyone that doesn't know the name Ban Su Han, you've probably seen the most famous thing he's done, which is that famous kick scene out of Billy Jack. Second, the second, I, I think you the know second this. movie, you're right, Billy Jack. Yeah. yeah, second one. Yeah, but that, I'm going to take my right foot and put it on the right side of your face and there's nothing you can do about it. That was Ban Su Han. No, no, that was Billy Jack. No, he 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 was the stunt double for that scene. Oh, Really? Yeah, because he was the one that taught Tom Laughlin Hapkido. And for that scene, they decided that Tom Laughlin's Hapkido skill wasn't quite there. So they, they doubled they in Bon Suhan to do that kick Yeah, in the first yeah, movie. So, yeah, so he's the one that did that kick. Oh, well, and, you know, and that that's a classic to this day as far as I'm concerned. One right? of the best scenes ever. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so much fun. So much fun. 
Uh, but one of the other ones that we did recently was on martial arts weapons and how you can track the flow of swords and everything moving from China through Korea to Japan mm-hmm. over the years. I mean, it, it, you know, almost everything that's happened with martial arts on a large scale seems to have originated in China and flowed through to Japan. So exactly. I've, and o- I've found that fascinating. And Okinawa was a key. That's the point. Okinawa being closest to the mainland, you know, where it's located was, uh, right straight across virtually from Fujial area, you know, that, mm. uh, was key because that was where you got this blend of the Shaolin arts, then be, then moving toward the islands and then being tweaked to accommodate the, the culture and you know, the thought process. Uh, but you still see a lot of the original white crane and tiger fist and monk fist, uh, dragon and all that shows itself in those, those Miyagi style forms coming from that training over more so than what it appears later when it gets further down into Japan. Mm. So there is this, that's what I'm talking about. This, this Chinese goju is, uh, and it's part of the evolution that we get into Japanese karate. And, And I'm closer to the, the Shaolin side of that, you see. And that was the leap that my teacher made when he came from Okinawa is that he brought with him some old film and stuff too they'd done of Southern Shaolin Kung Fu. And that part of his orientation back in the day with with Miyagi's Goju, uh, studying under someone who studied under Miyagi, uh, was this still this love for the, the Shaolin influence. So the way I trained, I, I, I really had this original Gang Ru, which is the Chinese word for hard soft. Uh, that was more of what I was starting in, and that's why I think it gave me such a love for Shaolin when I got a chance to do that. Oh, neat. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. So we talked a little bit about movies before. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite overall martial arts movie? <sighs> I, I chuckle because, you know, having uh, met Frank Dukes, um, and since he and I both share the same honor, and his reputation, which is debated by some, you know, did he do what he said he did or not? I don't know uh, any of the answers to those things. You know, I think the movie that Von Damme did about Frank Dukes, uh, Bloodsport, is a very violent movie. But it's supposed to represent for us, uh, again, the first white guy to find his way into the underground arts competitions. Again, bridging that gap, going through the ceiling, you know, a pioneer type thing. That, I like that concept in the movie a lot. I like that whole thing. I also am a big, I'm a Jackie Chan fan. We've got a little connection to Jackie Chan. He's an honorary member of our organization. And, uh, whether Jackie Jackie didn't directly acknowledge it, but we we informed him that he'd been inducted into our organization. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to claim him now, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, my one of my instructors knows Jackie Chan. You know, and, and just he's just hard to reach. You know, it's hard hard to get a hold of. But uh, we, um, uh, you know, his his movies are if you just want fun. You know, he never really knows. He's a great entertainer, and uh, I like. I like some, you know, my my favorite Jackie Chan. I guess my favorite movie is, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's the um, the wooden uh, the Shaolin wooden men is what it's about. When he trains at Shaolin and then has to fight the wooden soldiers to to make okay. the next. I'm not familiar with that one. I'll have to look it up. Um, and well, anyway, it, it's actually along the same stories that I was told by my teacher and my training partner, whose name was Wong Chung Wing, from uh, who would tell me these stories from China and the legends that Jackie Chan and uh, would then make movies about. These stories are famous, and and he'd start seeing the movies based on the legends that I was hearing verbally from my Chinese training partner. And which really made them come to life. I said, "Well, I, I'd hear the stories, and I was like, oh, there's a movie. Holy cow! It was just fun.' Shaolin Wooden, I think Shaolin Wooden Men. That's what it's called. Uh, Jackie Chan. Uh, that's that's probably my favorite. Cool. 
and we'll definitely check that out and link to it in the show notes for anybody that might be new to the show. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We post all the stuff that we talk about in the episodes over there. So I'm, I think I might know the answer, but I'll ask the question anyway. Who's your favorite martial arts actor? <laughs> I'm laughing because I like so many of them. Um, and I just don't want to give a sentimental answer because sentimentally, I guess it'd be Jackie Chan. But um, I mean, Bruce Lee's movies were great, but Bruce Lee wasn't a great actor. I mean, you know, he was intense, but he was more a performer than an actor. So I guess it, maybe I'm splitting words. Um, I think Jackie Chan's a true entertainer. I mean, the guy really, he trained for that. That's what he trained for Chinese opera, was to entertain. Right. And so I, I think Jackie Chan's got to be my final answer on that. Okay. How about books? Are you at all a reader? Any martial arts books that come to mind? Yeah, yeah. Um, the What I've been... Uh, working with more recently and just glad to have a copy of uh, was McCarthy's uh, edition of the Bubishi that was published. And that's been a good work uh, to fill in a lot of gaps about the history of martial arts going into Okinawa and Japan uh, and tracing it back into its southern Shaolin roots. It's just a good work uh, overall. Uh, and I've been recommending it to all my my students, my my teachers, to make sure they get a copy of that and read that. It's it's so much of it sounds familiar to me from back when we were doing it orally, you know, getting the same kinds of lessons and stuff from my teachers, uh, yeah. and then to see it all kind of cataloged and pulled together from the old Shaolin Bronze Man, uh, and then some of the Wu Dang influence all kind of pulled together in there. Uh, my school, for instance, we're, we're, we're adherents of the 36 vital striking points more so. And um, that's cataloged in there, too, with some comparisons and disagreements. <laughs> you know, it's hard to pin it down, but we, uh, I, I really appreciate that work a lot. I think it's Paul McCarthy, McCarthy, I believe, is, who's, uh, who edited that. Uh, that's a good work. Now, Certainly, you're you're still active, and I mean, you're exploring, you're researching things. So, it must mean that you've got some goals. There's some stuff that you're trying to accomplish. Would you mind telling us a bit about what you're working towards? Uh, that's an interesting question because a lot of what we've done has been uh, by grace. That's the only way to say it. When I I've just wanted to teach over the years and had no idea that we would become a full fledged incorporated organization and an association of, of the caliber we are now was not, that was not a goal. It evolved that way because what we were doing was worth people's attention and time. And it grew because it was a worthy project. The, so everything I've got so far has been gravy. Quite frankly, I had no intention of ever getting as far. The, because for me, it's still just fun. I do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I respect it and appreciate its discipline and its opportunities to for personal development, like you said earlier. It's one of our big values in this thing. Uh, and Wu Chi, Wu Chi Kung Fu, as I call it, really found me. I um, That's a whole other story, but I had already developed a philosophy uh, and wrote a book for my schools called The Circle and the Serpent that outlined my principles based on my training. And I, I had inspiration and, quite frankly, sort of a revelation, and you might call it, uh, and I, I called this thing that I was describing Wu Chi Chan Fa, Wu Chi Kung Fu. I get word out about that, and suddenly I get contacted by a rather obscure group of people who say to me, "Welcome to the, welcome to our circles." Uh, there's a Wu Chi Chan uh, martial art out there. You know, there's a whole system, and what you described is us. 
<laughs> going, I had no clue you existed. I mean, <laughs> but, but, but together we have come to the same place and same conclusion in our journey, uh, independently of each other, and yet we share the same values. It was an amazing discovery. Um, and so I backed into this whole thing to begin with. And I think it has more, I think martial arts has a goal for me rather than me have a goal for it. I believe that Wu Chi Kung Fu uh, may be continuing to impose its will on me along the way. Uh, that may be a strange answer, but uh, again, I don't think I found it as much as it's been finding me. Um, yes, it may sound esoteric and a little bizarre, but that's kind of my experience with it. So, interesting question. I, I would reverse it. I wonder what the goals are of Wu Chi Chan for me. I'm yet to discover <laughs> some of them. Well, I think the only people that would call that, you know, a, a bizarre answer or at all disparage it aren't training themselves because it doesn't take very long in your martial arts training to know that sometimes it gets a little weird. And <laughs> we as martial artists, like, we we can be a weird bunch. And I think the more you give yourself over to your training and just kind of let it happen, let it take you where it's going to go, the more good stuff happens. Well, and and there, there are some good science out there now. Actually, there are theories that I can't get into fully because I'm not totally qualified, but uh, the new uh, particle science is out there and uh, explore how the universe is sort of a repository of sorts and that there's nothing lost in the universe, including knowledge, and that there is some sort of repository of things that one's subconscious may actually tap into at times, knowledge that may seem like revelation, but it's it's floating around out there and an open mind to it actually receives it. Uh, that's mm-hmm. not just craziness now. They're actually talking about that in in some of the uh, particle theory stuff that's out there now. Quantum physics is talking about that very thing. So uh, a scientist can explain it better, but, but it's not so far off of what my experience has been is that somehow or another at times I feel like I've tapped into some sort of repository of of images and impressions that uh, have influenced me and it even explains why I don't know why I know certain techniques. I've never been shown those techniques, yet I will know them as if mm. I've known them forever. Um, I've shared with my students at times where I've had a dream of a technique that I and what it was called, and I'd say I've never seen it. And then six months later, find the technique. Um, it's just strange, and I don't even know how to explain it, other than maybe quantum physics is on to something. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're at a pretty exciting time in science where we're, science is starting to explain some of the things that some of us have believed for a long time. So I think that'll be interesting to see where that goes. But if someone wants to get a hold of you, if they're in your area, they're traveling through, or you know they want to reach out to you, maybe come train, how would they get a hold of you? Or well, myself- And what else do you have going on that people might be interested in? Well, you know, I'm glad to talk with anyone uh, about the art. Again, for me, it still remains my love, of my, but, but more like a hobby. I, I don't do it for salary. I don't do it. I do it. I teach two classes here locally in Tai, tai Chi, Chi Kung classes, just out of my love for my community and my friends. Uh, and those are open to anyone. The, uh, but anyone can talk to me gladly. Uh, I'll tell them, share any of my stories or my experiences or help them any way I can. They can reach me by my phone number. Uh, I don't. Uh, your, the audience you have has been, uh, for the most part, you think a pretty responsible audience. I mean, I'm not going to get a lot of crank calls. Absolutely, no, no. I, I haven't heard anything for that. And what we'll do, rather than um, some people are, are very open, and we put the phone number in the show notes. Rather than doing that, we'll just why don't you say it a couple times? And if someone truly wants to talk to you, they'll. They'll do so. I, I, I have faith in this audience. Okay, great. Uh, and you understand my caution. Absolutely. You know, because you know, I don't want someone calling me up and say, you know, I know, I'm, I'm an older guy now. I'm not interested. In, I'm not interested in challenging, being challenged by anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well past that. Well, to my knowledge, <laughs> and, and I'll admit, we don't we don't keep tabs on every guest that's come through. As far as I know, they're all still alive. Okay, good. So I don't think we have to worry. <laughs> You know, uh, but uh, if I can be of any any help and insight for anyone, uh, my my 
my cell number is area code 561-351-4434. That's, and again, that's area code 561-351-4434. Now you mentioned uh, a book you wrote for your for your students. Is that at all available to others? Is that published? Yeah, uh, it, it it's not published through uh, a major publication. We have our own internal publishing. Um, okay. We could provide a copy. To I, mean, I have an administrator who also is running a school in the Minneapolis area who can get copies to anybody that might want them. I also have a manual for my Qigong technique, which is unique in the area of field of Qigong, too, that I'm teaching that was affirmed by a a grandmaster out of Beijing as being a a good, you know, in other words, legitimate Qigong form to teach. And uh, it's, um, but I found that I've been sharing that to the public and we have, I have a little manual for that if someone wanted it as well. So, um, and it's, it expresses the, the Wu Qi philosophy that, that, my schools are embracing uh, the idea of the circle, basically. And the circle is not a new idea at all, but we follow the circle and things circle back around. And the circle represents emptiness, which you alluded to earlier. That one has to be empty sure. to be, in order to be ready to be filled with anything. So emptiness is a key component and character in our our system, uh, which is the, the zero, you know, for us. Uh, which has lots of symbolic meaning in the Chinese language as well. So um, the book sort of explores that a little bit and what that means and how it plays out in our training. It's called The Circle and the Serpent uh, because our our logo, or my logo, is a mythical creature uh, who has, it's a snake with two heads mm-hmm. uh, that the heads intertwined to form a circle. And so that has its own story and history behind it too for what we do. Great. Well, I really, really appreciate you being here, Sifu. And why don't you bring us out on a high note? Any parting advice for everyone listening? Yeah. Uh, I will share with you what I believe that I received as inspiration. Uh, in, in one of those moments when you do your meditations and you get these insights and whatever other weird things happen to people <laughs> when they go into these places. <laughs> but one of my, I remember one of those experiences I had where you, you kind of felt like you were in the presence, you know, sort of a moment that I felt like I was in the presence of, of the great masters of the past. I mean, I actually felt, there's, I had an experience where I really believed I was in the hall of masters in, in some other place. And uh, of all people, Jigaro Kano, I associated this from him, who was a, the pioneer of judo, spoke to me. I don't know Jigaro. I mean, but I respected his work. But he said one word, and I'll pass that word on to everybody else, because it's so important. He said, relax. Just relax. One of the great legends of Shaolin Masters is there was always this belief that even if you weren't physically present with your your master, that there was a form of communication that continued between one another. The masters had the ability to communicate things to their students even at a distance. That's a quantum thing again. But those legends exist in Shaolin circles. My teacher claimed that was true. For him, it was his teacher. And I, I would say it's true. And so some of the stuff is based on legends, but my experience has been that there are times I've known things that I just knew them and I felt they came from that connection. So it may sound weird, but it actually has precedent when you go do the research on some of the legendary relationships that masters have had with their masters. So I didn't want to leave it just hanging out that I'm some weirdo, but, uh, but there is, there are the stories. And, and again, my teacher also claimed the same with his master. He said he would know that if something happened to his master, he would know at that very moment anywhere he was in the world. So, yeah. you know, psychic connections are kind of part of what we experience and train with. And so when I leave you that little word from of relax, it, it comes from one of those same places. 
Thank you for listening to episode 94 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sifu Gary. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for links to Sifu Gary's website, his organization, Facebook page, and even a poster with a kung fu form he developed and a great accompanying story. It's a lot of fun. If you like the show, be sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find yours and mention it on the air, go ahead and email us, and we're going to send you a box of Whistlekick stuff. I'm not going to tell you what's going to be in it, but it's good stuff. If you haven't left us a review yet, please help us out. Leave us a review. Those reviews really help us expose the show to new listeners. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a topic for a Thursday show or just some other feedback, there's a place to do that over there as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is, you guessed it, Whistlekick. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon for some of them, like our great sparring gloves. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our heavily discounted wholesale program. But until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. My, my Sifu uh, had this kind of casual approach to it, but very intense at the same time. He, uh, but every class, we had a hard workout, and then he told stories. He would, mm. he would always have a break time when you're kind of you know, resting now to get ready for the actual training stuff where you do the techniques always a break time and he would have a story to tell about some some adventure he had with a student or uh, some story from his training you know whatever it was uh, something about one of the animal styles and that you're right that was my favorite time I mean I got so much out of that just listening to the yeah. stories and then I started passing those on and doing the same thing when I began classes at the University of North Dakota back in 